So, good morning. Good morning. Sorry I'm a little late, but it looks like it worked out pretty good anyway. So, is that Carson? What's that? Through town? No, um, well, I know most of you guys. I'm horrible with names, but I know most of you guys. And this is what the third season that we've been doing this. So, I mean, does it seem like it's working out okay for you guys? I guess oh, yeah. you're still using it. So, it's great. Okay, good. So um, we're totally set up for 2016, so everybody's locked in, ready to go, and then as I do coordinate a lot of the education stuff for you guys, um, you know, somebody will call in the day before they're supposed to be down here and go, you know, I've got to scrub my cat's ass or something and I won't be here, but we make it work. And I think we got some good topics, and one of the things that um, Nick said you guys wanted was pain management, and he wasn't real specific about what you were looking at. So I assumed that you guys didn't want like uh, you know graduate level pathophysiology of <coughs> nerve impulse crap. So I'm really? gonna really, damn, yeah. you are gonna be sorely disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> so so I kept it kind of generic. Um, a lot of it's gonna be just really basic review, and then we'll just talk <coughs> about um, analgesia delivery pre hospitally I don't know what you guys' protocols really are for that. Um, there's some new stuff out, but what I would really like to impress upon you with this isn't so much, you guys know how to give pain meds. You know when somebody's hurting, right? Um, what I'd really like to impress and what they're really pushing in the field is we have pain scoring tools and all that, but they have a lot of shortcomings. Mainly, we're kind of pigeonholing someone's pain into what we think it should be, right? So we say, give us a number between 1 and 10, or we use the Long Baker scale, or we try and assess how they're acting. When in fact, a lot of times, just their self-reporting of their pain is all you really need. And so the biggest thing for pre-hospital folks is to kind of believe the patients, especially the people that tend to cry wolf a lot. Um, you know, fibromyalgia comes to mind. People think that it's just complete BS, and actually it's scientifically proven to exist. You know, but how far do you go with that kind of stuff? And we're used to, as EMS people, I think, we're used to looking at pain as something that is almost like a like a critical presentation. You know, somebody's got a busted leg and their bones are sticking out, they're bleeding all over, and they're writhing on the ground. That's how we look at pain. But we get someone that complains about pain, but they don't manifest a lot of distress. And the first thing that we think of, right, is drug-seeking behavior. Well, maybe not you guys, but a lot of people, right? So you have to you have to kind of run it through your filters. So we'll talk about that. So that's really the biggest thing I would, I would try and push. So we got a lot of new people. We've Our nurses that we've hired, um, we've got a bunch of people in orientation right now. Just, you know, background information. They are, most of them have never worked pre-hospitally. So the scene stuff is going to be different for them. But I, I would like to think that most of our paramedics are pretty experienced and can show them that stuff. Now, we hired a guy from like Yosemite Search and Rescue, so working in high stress situations where you have to be right the first time, he's got years of experience hanging on the big walls of El Cap rescuing people. So he just hasn't done it out of a helicopter on a scene with fire departments. But I mean, the background is just a matter of filling in some of the blanks for him. Um, we've got some really quality people, I think, and it tends to be a younger group which, I guess, relatively speaking, everybody's younger than I am, you know? I am now the grandpa of Careflight. Now that <laughs> Sue, Maggie, <laughs> Moeller, and everybody have either left or retired, um, shit, I'm older than two-thirds of the damn pilots. <laughs> Never used to bother me, now I go into work and I'm like, you know, I, like I forget something or I can't see something, I have to put on my reading glasses and it, like, bugs me before I used to laugh. Now I'm like, shit. I'm like, really the old guy. Um, but it's a, it's a good thing. So I don't think it's going to change a lot for you guys. In fact, I think it'll probably be better. Um, we're going to be making the base coordinator people that run the base more of a manager position. So they'll be, you'll have, a, you know, you guys won't see most of that's on our side. But, but uh, hopefully uh, it'll work out. So anyway, so um, we'll talk a little bit about pain. So like, you know, any... Uh, presentation, we've got to have objectives, right, so that you guys can get your CME stuff. Um, this is all, you know, fairly, fairly basic, fairly basic. But if you have questions, um, don't hesitate to ask. 
And I'd like to do some discussion too. Some stuff. So how does it work? This is the stuff I was telling you I wasn't going to show you. So this is about as much as you're going to see. And we're not going into the cellular details, which I think is probably good because I probably wouldn't do a great job of it anyway. But needless to say, it's kind of covered by most of the frontal areas and midbrain areas. Um, the, the thalamus and the insular cortex and the amygdala and the limbic system really, really are the big purveyors of pain stuff. So it just gives you an idea that there's more to pain than just somebody whacking their hand and having pain <coughs> at their hand, right? So we take care of pain in all forms and fashion. So you guys know all about afferent and efferent nerve transmission, right? I mean, that's like EMT 101, so you guys know that stuff. So you essentially have a uh, nociceptor on your hand or anywhere. It's just a pain receptor, right? You get the impulse. It travels up your afferent pathways, goes to your brain, gets processed, comes down the efferent pathways, creates a motor response, which makes your hand jerk away. That's pretty much how it works, only it just happens really fast. The problem with that is when you have disease processes, it can interfere with that nerve transmission. So people may not feel pain normally. Or if you're a patient that has chronic pain, so if any of you guys have like chronic pain, you busted your ankle, um, it hurts every day, it's an 8 out of 10, you take a ton of Tylenol or whatever, you're going to perceive that pain totally differently than somebody who doesn't really experience much. In some ways that may be kind of a good thing that you get some pain tolerance. But what we need to understand as care providers is that people that are, have chronic pain, their perception and their interpretation of their pain is completely different than that person that's never really been hurt. Right? So that gives you some relative perspective on what's really bad and what isn't and how we're going to treat it. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. So we're just going to stick to some of the basics. Okay? So some basic physiology. Um, evaluation and scoring tools, barriers to delivering pain meds, common analgesics that we use pre-hospitally because there is a whole boatload of stuff if we were to go into all of them that are used, right? And then just some uh, kind of trending stuff, okay? So if you wanted to look at it in a chart format, this is pretty much how pain set up. It's kind of the main stuff. Okay, you got types and sources, so you've got acute versus chronic, it's not, that's not like rocket science, right? And then you've got your nociceptive pain, which is just pain receptor stuff, and you guys all remember visceral versus somatic pain, kind of how you kind of determine the differences, so that when somebody's complaining of a certain type of pain, it kind of helps lead you down the path, one way or the other, what you may be dealing with. Just like when you're looking at MI patients, for example, and you're looking at the difference between an anterior and inferior MI. When you learn that, you kind of learn to look at them from across the room, and you <coughs> kind of start, already start branching out to where you're going. And then neuropathic pain, which I think we probably see a lot more than we, we realize. And that's CNS derived, okay? So that's stuff like spinal cord injuries, phantom limb pain. Have you ever transported or had anybody that had phantom limb pain? They're an amputee but they still feel like their leg hurts. Um, diabetic neuropathy, I bet you see a ton of that. I know we do. Not necessarily as the main cause for them calling, but you see it as a comorbidity that we deal with when we're transporting. Right? So, kind of the universal thing. Even though we understand pain better than ever, and there is, I mean, it's a specialty in anesthesia, pain management. I mean, there's entire, maybe not hospitals, but centers that are, their entire focus is pain management. It's that complex. So we could turn this into a, a two-hour or a two-day lecture if we really wanted to get into detail. But what if the stuff you guys could use, it'd give you a ton of relative understanding, but you'd probably forget two-thirds of it by the time you walk out of the room. And not because you're old like me, but because it's just irrelevant and you're not, you don't use it, right? Okay. So, but even though it's, even though um, pain is understood better than ever, it's still probably, especially in the EMS thing, underappreciated and the most undertreated thing that we run into in our practice. Okay. I see it even with the people I work with. 
um, for all kinds of reasons. What are some reasons we might undertreat pain? What do you? What's common that you hear from people? You think it's BS. Okay, you think it's BS. Exactly. Their perception, that's a biggie, right? So that makes it go under underappreciated and undertreated. Okay, what else do you think? I can tell you one of the things that that I hear not frequently so much anymore because of education, um, but we used to hear a lot was, well, I really don't want to mask their signs and symptoms because the doc won't be able to do a proper evaluation. Now, what kind of freaking BS is that? If you were laying on the ground and you couldn't get up, and I came to you to take care of you, and I said, well, you know, I'd like to give you pain med, but I want the doc an hour and a half later to be able to see what's going on, so I'm not going to help you. You'd be like, what kind of show are you guys running? You know what I mean? And that's the kind of stuff that I want to impress on you. Um, so you hear that a lot. You hear that a lot with head injuries. Right? We don't want to give them fentanyl, or we don't want to give them morphine, or we don't want to bring their pain down because we don't want to alter them because then the neurosurgeon can't do a proper assessment. When in reality, what's going to happen is if you learn to titrate your pain a little bit, your pain meds, your management, you'll make that assessment clearer for them, and you'll help that person and they're just going to go to the CT scanner when they get into the ER. They're not going to base whether or not they drill their head or take them to surgery or whatever based on their complaints. They're going to scan them so they have physical evidence of what's going on. Okay, so that's kind of one of the underappreciated factoids that you know once you've been in the field for a long time, but when you're new, you, you don't really know, right? Okay, does that make sense? Okay. So what is it? Really, you can't do a thing without a definition. Well, I can't. Anyway, but I'm not going to read that to you. What I really want you to know, I mean, well, I mean, look at those three illustrations, I guess. They're all a different illustration of pain, right? I'm, I mean, the lady on the bottom looks dead, actually. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, that's a... <laughs> I, that probably hurt. I probably safe to say that hurts. Um, the tibia ankle fracture thing. Um, I can tell you that hurts. <laughs> That's how mine looked, and uh, it hurts. And it doesn't matter how much pain medicine they give you; it does not freaking make a difference. Okay. What about the guy on the upper right? He calls you because <clears throat> he's having head pain, or he's just things are just hurting. Is this a person that you put in the category of BS? You know what I mean? Who are we to say? I mean, we don't really know. And really what we do, and I'm certainly not trying to lecture you, but being a, a chronic pain person myself, I think I've gotten a better appreciation over the last 15 years of that. Um, pain is what patients say it is. You know? I mean... We have for so long tried to pigeonhole people's pain evaluation into what we think it should be. And it really is about, you know how they say perception is reality, and I know that sounds all like boulderish and, you know, ohm and all that crap stuff. Uh, but it really is, right? Perception is reality. And if we're just taking care of people, which is what we do, we just take care of people. We're going to run into these folks, and we're going to need to manage them. Now, that doesn't mean everybody gets pain meds because they have a headache, but something to think about. But at the bottom, the thing that I really wanted you to, to take away from it is it also includes their perception and their subjective interpretation of the discomfort. And that can be changed or affected by tons of things outside of our control. Okay? And outside of their control, which also makes them perceive their pain to be worse than it may be if you and I were experiencing it. So, just think about it. Sound like a damn father, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, what are the, some? Of the, what's the benefit of pain? What's one of the big benefits? You protect yourself, then. Yeah. yeah, totally, man. You stick your hand in the fire. You jerk your hand out before you torch it. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's supposed to do that. That's really what pain is all about. The problem is when we have chronic pain or repeated episodes of acute pain, it totally alters our perception, okay, psychologically, emotionally, and physically. So that wind-up phenomena 
is something that occurs with people that have chronic episodes of acute pain and their sympathetic system gets wrapped up, wound up, right? And it stays that way. So it affects all their interpretation of pain response. So what is a 10 to you and I may only be a 6 or a 4 to them even though they're way up here. And so we underappreciate the level of pain that they're truly in. So we don't treat it, or we don't treat it as aggressively as we could. You guys are always really good about treating pain. I mean, like I said, I don't know what your protocols are. And hasn't fentanyl really made our life a lot easier? Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't have a lot of hemodynamic effects. It doesn't put people out, but it can if we want it to when we combine it with other meds, right? But it works. And it's a really nice, nice drug. Okay? Um, so... You talk about people with arthritis, um, you know what hyperalgesia is, and then <coughs> allodynia is just one of those things that occurs with people that have chronic pain that are in that wound up phase, where it's an actual physiological thing. This normally doesn't cause pain, does it? I mean, if I do this, that's nothing. Person suffering from that, you may as well be pounding their finger with a nail. Okay, I mean, so things don't normally cause pain, create excruciating pain, and it's real. But we don't get that because we may not be educated the fact that that condition even exists. Okay, so we think they're BSing us, when in fact they're not. It's, it can be really hard to determine the difference, I mean, I get that. So that's one of those things everybody always goes to in a sense like, you have the patient who's going, oh, it hurts, it hurts, it hurts. And then you go to start the IV so you can give them pain meds and they go, ah, and jerk away. It's like, okay, never mind. It doesn't really hurt. You're a pussy. <laughs> this well, is you know what? We have those. I mean, I've been doing this a long time, just that like you guys. Exceptional allodynia. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah, that's I mean, what we'll call it. We'll start a new thing. Maybe yeah. <laughs> make some money off of it. Um, you're right. So what this is, is a true condition. I'm not talking about people that are really bad actors. But that would be, you can, that needle poke potentially could be them responding to yes, that. Yes, it could truly be a true condition. <clears throat> so, a lot of what we do as pre-hospital providers, I mean, and I don't want to get into philosophy and all that garbage, right? Because you guys didn't ask me down here to talk about that. But we do sociological evaluations of people all the time, don't we? And emotional and psychological. we got to be people's parents, their kids, their whatever, you know? And that's part of that. You have to be able to kind of evaluate and sift through that stuff. Now, how if this is a true condition, how might you figure that out? Besides just asking them. Like ask family members? You know, get a second opinion kind of thing? That's what I do. Because, you know, can I tell that this is real? I mean, I go with my gut. That's what I've learned to trust more than anything, and it's rarely wrong, okay? But get a second opinion. Talk to the family. Talk to, you You know, like, if you notice, when you guys come to us, there's a few of us that will always say, hey, do you know this person? Because why would we do that? Because you have relative perspective on what the hell's going on with them, right? If you've been there ten times in the last ten days and it's all turned out to be BS, now that doesn't mean it's not real this time, you have perspective. This may be the first time I've ever met this person. So I always ask, or it's a pretty common thing that I ask, because I think you guys are a huge source of valuable information. And hopefully other people use that, you know, avail themselves of the information that you have. Because, you know, it's just like you guys have been with them for 30 minutes, 40 minutes. You have all those details. I don't have any of that. When I go to the ER and I walk in to give report to a doc and he just like kind of nudges me off to the side and starts talking to the patient. I used to get my panties all in a twist, right? Because it would get me all upset. Now I'm like, hey man, unless it's really critical because they're going to miss something that could affect the patient, whatever they want to do. If they want to make their life harder, that's totally their game. Okay, I'm not going to lose a lot of sleep over trying to convert the fact that they're narcissistic. You know? Um, however, <clears throat> we are patient advocates, right? That's our job. That's one of our jobs. You guys have tons of jobs, but we need to be patient advocates. So um, we need to be able to sort through that. Well, I'm really getting off on tangents today. 
It's not I had enough coffee or something. So, some other effects, right? Weakness. But these are long-term things that are actual physical manifestations that have been proven to occur with people that have multiple episodes of acute pain or chronic pain, right? So if you're having a ton of pain, poor wound healing, well, that can really affect you. <laughs> if we don't control somebody's pain and they're a multi-system trauma patient and they're going to spend a month in the ICU, if we can change that to two weeks or three weeks, have we done them a favor? Big time, not only financial, but I mean just their well-being, right? So taking care of the pain from the very beginning has a really positive effect on their outcome. Muscle breakdown, um, sodium and water retention. People get all swelled up, and part of that is all the uh, catecholamine response and prostaglandins and bradykinins and all that jazz that cause inflammation. Okay, but if we can diminish that a little bit by taking care of their pain or assisting with that, um, then that's a good thing. And obviously, we all know about constipation and decreased GI motility, right? And then the tachycardia hypertension. So when you have somebody that's tachycardic and hypertensive, we want to treat their pain and their head injury. Is that like something that's pertinent? Yeah. Because we remember the Monroe Kelly doctrine where you only have so much space and it's taken up by the fluid in the brain itself and one has to give so the other can expand kind of thing. Okay. Well, what we would rather not have give is the brain too much because then it gets compressed and it causes damage and blah 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 all that jazz. Okay, so if we can decrease their tachycardia and hypertension and decrease that sympathetic response, are we doing them a favor? Big time. So, and this is where I notice that you guys are pretty comfortable with fentanyl. It's like any new drug. When it's new you kind of put your foot in the water, you know, or your toe in the water, you kind of test it out because you're not really sure. You guys come to us with people that have head injuries and they've got like 100, 200 mics of fentanyl and it's like, that's awesome. You know, I mean, if we need to intubate them to take care of them, okay. So, what's the big deal with that? What we need to do is take care of the brain. And that's what you're doing, okay? So that makes a huge difference. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Am I like preaching to the choir? Well, yeah, pretty much. But, okay. So the chronic pain cycle. Anybody in here have like what you would call chronic pain and they determine that as anything greater than like a month that you can't take care of, you know, with analgesia type stuff. I can tell you that, I mean, from personal experience and then from taking care of patients for the last 26 years or whatever, um, it's a huge deal. It's only just begun since about 2009-2010 pain became a real bona fide specialty of medicine that was researched and um, investigated and entire like continuums of care were devoted to just pain management. Now I know this is going, I mean, we don't really do that, but it just tells you it's 2010, it's only 2016, right? So it's like they're just beginning to learn about the long-term effects of chronic pain, for example. If you have chronic pain, then you know how it saps your energy, you can't sleep, you uh, changes your mood, like you're bit, you can be bitchy one minute, great the next minute, um, and you just end up, because of all these things, your activity level drops, people tend to gain weight, they can't do what they want to do, they become depressed, I mean it's just like spiral, right? And we can actually really affect these people, even if it's for only a short period of time, if they happen to call us, and um, we are able to give them some analgesia. Now, we all have people that we go, okay, so what are you allergic to? And they're like, well, I'm allergic to Tylenol, Advil, and morphine. The only thing that works for me is Dilaudid. <coughs> they might be right, actually. <laughs> but generally, the first thing we think is, hmm, okay, or, you know, whatever. Um, but we carry stuff like fentanyl. Fentanyl's like 80 to 100 times more potent than morphine and considered to be about 50%, 50 <coughs> times more potent than pure grade 90% or greater heroin. So I mean, it's a big drug, right? Is it a big drug of abuse? It's a huge drug of abuse. Um, in pre-hospital care and in the hospital, it's huge and it's clear. So it's very easy to change out water for fentanyl, okay? Um, people overdose on fentanyl all the time and respiratory arrest, it's that powerful. 
It's just that a lot of the people we see are either have a tolerance because they're taking pain meds chronically, or as I like to say, pain is the perfect antidote for narcotics. Right? So, I mean, if you give somebody too much narcotics, yeah, you can give them Narcan, but then you're just kind of chasing them. I mean, all you have to do is, like, wiggle their injury a little bit, you know. <laughs> do that, but that'll wake them right up. Right? It's a great antidote for narcotics. So just be aware that we're going to be dealing with those people. And then here's just kind of another thing of how the pain impulse is transmitted. Okay, but it happens so quick, you know, millionth of a second kind of thing. But here's where we run into people that have diabetic neuropathies, okay, right? So they can end up with the neuropathic type pain that's kind of the burning, stinging, whatever pain that they normally have. Or they may have really crappy pain transmission, impulse transmission, because of uh, gray or because of white matter demyelination of their nerves, right? And they should feel pain, but they don't. So they sustain greater injuries. Same thing. So, and that's just more of an explanation of how it works. We kind of use a pain scale, um, but more importantly, the patient's own reports of their pain level and tolerance. Okay. okay, enough for philosophy class. <laughs> so how do we recognize it? If somebody's screaming on the ground, those are the easy ones, right? I mean, those are pretty easy. But what about, like this lady here, she's in the hospital obviously, but she's unconscious. She's intubated. She's probably sedated. How do we tell how much pain she's in? How do we quantify it so we can justify treating it? Because we have to quantify it. I mean, you guys have a pain scale in your charting system, right? Whether it's 1 to 10, the bomb, oh, bomb waker, <laughs> the long baker scale, uh, whatever. Um, but you have to be able to justify that you did an assessment on the pain and you were able to quantify it so that you could treat it and show some type of effect, whether it's a good effect or a bad effect, for your treatment. Bong waiver is probably a true scale now. <laughs> well, you know, it is in Reno every day. <laughs> true scale. What about this gentleman? Okay, so do we see people like this in the nursing homes? Mm -hmm. Big time. I mean, he could have, this may be like what's called locked-in syndrome, right? or he could be catatonic, he might have Alzheimer's or dementia. They have entire educational platforms that teach caregivers how to determine pain in Alzheimer's and dementia patients because we have to be able to quantify it. She's going to be easy. Because either she just lost the really big score or she's got something broke for sure. Okay? So, just a little more of this, then we'll get on to the, the real stuff. So, is it physical? Is it emotional? Is it psychological? Is it what we think it is? Okay, because bias comes into pain management in a huge way. And it's a huge thing to try and get people turned around. Or, is it what your patient says it is, even though it doesn't meet our criteria? Okay, which is why I think we need to have a little bit more of an open mind. So, ask yourself this. You guys think you're pretty good at treating pain? I know, since I came to CareFlight, I'm much better at treating pain. Well, I've grown up, too, as well. Because um, I, you know, everybody was, I thought, was trying to scan. And we have a really generous pain management, um, not really a protocol, but an understanding and a culture at CareFlight. Um, I personally, if I drop somebody off damn near unconscious in the ER, I couldn't give two shits whether it bothers the ER doc. If they were in that much pain... I was just about to say, I think that we are our biggest critics, and that is a culture thing. You guys are okay with it. We, some of our people might kind of turn their nose up at you, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that happened to me just the other day in the ER. I brought a lady in that was... She was like you said, she had a tolerance to pain meds. She'd been using pain meds for a long, long time. Yeah. But she fell and broke her hip. Her hip was busted. And so her muscles are all retracted up. I brought her into the ER 
uh, of my radio report, I told him I gave her 10 of morphine and 2 of her sed. And when I walked in the door, the ER doc chewed me up. And I was like, look really? at her. Not your call. She's sitting upright talking to you. Yeah. You know, she's talking to me and still telling me sitting upright after 10 of morphine and 2 of her sed, she's in 8 out of 10 pain. Like, I feel like I still haven't done my job and you're yelling at me. So it's... We, you do run into it. And that's <clears> the thing. We're kind of on the low end of the food chain when it comes to that stuff. Um, and we run into that in Reno all the time. We take a, there's a specific trauma surgeon at Sutter Roseville over in California, or over, <laughs> not Sutter Roseville, Indiana. Uh, and we give morphine to trauma patients, or fentanyl, and he goes through the freaking roof every time we go in there. He's like, what the hell are you doing? I can't assess him. It's like, that's complete and utter bullshit. But now he's <laughs> Those people are hurting. They need to be treated. And pain is a vital sign. And it is a travesty that in this day and age, with all the stuff we can do, we still let people hurt because we're afraid to take care of it. You know what I mean? So I get what you're saying. We, it happens all, a lot. Mm -hmm. And we have some newer people that are on the cautious side. Um, not that they don't want to treat it, they do, but they're just, maybe they don't have a lot of experience making the autonomous decisions about that. After you've done it for a while, holy crap, you know, it's like 400 mics of fentanyl, 10 of MS, we're going to give them some ketamine, some Versed, and it's like, okay, so now we have to bag them up. Well, at least they're not hurting. I mean, we don't want to make them worse, right, and create an uh, aspiration problem or something, but my point is, it has to be treated. So, I mean, you're, you're right on. I mean, it's, and, and that's a culture thing. We can't change the people we deliver to. We can only change ourselves and keep pushing. Yeah, for sure. So what are some barriers? We've talked about most of them, really. Um, recognition that pain is present in the first, first place, right? We have to be able to recognize that they're in pain. And in order to recognize that pain, we have to look for it. So we have to assess it <coughs> with an open mind, okay? Um, language and cognition, and we won't go into a lot of that, but obviously language barriers are an issue, right? Around here, if you don't, I don't know, there's Spanish, and what other languages would you have down here in Garterville? Anything else? But it's hard if you can't speak their language because you can assume you know what they're trying to tell you, but if you can't really understand, then you're kind of at a loss. I mean, we kind of do things sometimes generically because we know they're hurting, so we just kind of do it and kind of uh, observe their response, right? Um, what about cognition? What about autistic kids? How do you determine their pain threshold? Or what kind of pain? <coughs> they or is it just emotional, psychological stuff? You know what I mean? That's like specialized training. It's really a hard thing to do. And it's not like we have, we're experts at it by any means. I am certainly not any kind of pain expert or any of that jazz. Um, emotional states impacted. Bias is a biggie. Um, and then misperceptions of both the patient and the provider. So. By that I mean the patient may, it may be cultural, okay? For them, you don't bitch about pain because that makes you a wuss. So when you act, you can tell when you look at their arm that their arm, is, that has got to hurt like a son of a bitch. And they say it's like a one or a two because that's just how they do it. But have we really done our job? And we get really hung up in this, well, if they say they don't want anything, we can't give it to them. And technically, I mean, you really can't, but when people are in pain, you see it in the aircraft all the time. No, I'm fine. I don't need any more pain medicine. Really? Because you're still, vital signs are not a really big indicator, although they can help. You're still writhing around, you can't lay still, you're grimacing, you're sweating, okay? <laughs> and you say you don't want any more. So we address that. We ask them, you know, are you afraid? Like, we're not going to put you to sleep. I mean, you're going to be totally in control, everything goes on, we're just going to help you with your pain. Most people say, oh, well, okay. Because they think we're going to, like, knock them out. Right? I mean, and we have longer periods of time with patients, but you guys, I mean, you're, you do ground transports all the time. I mean, you can be with somebody for two hours if it's a shitty snowstorm between here and Reno, and you have to be able to do, treat them, you know? And then lack of education on our part. We don't understand pain. We don't understand how it's manifested, um, the different types of people and how they present. So we can't really quantify what's going on with them, right? So... We can't treat it well. 
Okay, so all those are like barriers. Are there <coughs> other barriers that you would think of that would make it difficult to treat patients <coughs> in the pre-hospital setting that I miss? You guys can think of? Because generally I always leave something out. Not intentionally, but just because I miss it. I mean, that's probably the, probably the, probably yeah. the, uh, what's that? IV access. Okay, yeah, so the physical thing, like you can't, you can't get a line, okay? And you guys have intranasal um, protocols, right? Okay, so that helps, okay? But, I mean, that's, yeah, that's a barrier for sure. You get somebody that has, is really beat up, you can't get a line, for whatever reason you can't get an IO, okay? And you go to give them some intranasal fentanyl or Versed, and it's complete, their both nostrils are completely plugged with dry blood clots. So we're not going to work, right? So you have to clean it out. Because even though sublingual is a way to give meds, we don't have protocols for it, so that's like practicing medicine without a license. But there is sublingual fentanyl that they use in pain clinics. Or you have chronic cancer patients that have uh, G-tubes, right? And they don't take oral meds. They get all their meds through their tube. So do you have a protocol that allows you to be able to access that and help those people with their pain when you're transporting them either to or from hospice or wherever? Because those are the people that I feel really need our care <coughs> the most. I you know what I mean? Do a little booty bump. There you go. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Hey man, it's uh, you know it's vascular. What can I say? I had to think about that. I was just reading about uh, something else, and I read that. And I was like, I was like, never mind. So, yeah, the program that I came, not the program, but the ground ambulance that came from, we had a um, we had a big uh, hospice place in the hospital. It was like the entire third floor kind of deal, and so we had a contract with them that we would transport all of their hospice patients to and from the hospital to home, that kind of deal. And we were. You know, fairly busy service. I mean, covered 5,000 square miles with three ambulances, so we could stay pretty steady and have long transport times. So you were always trying to turn things so you get back to service. And when we did these transfers, if it took you four hours, but you did it with dignity and you helped their pain, nobody said a word. That was ex the expectation was that you would take as long as it took to be professional, make them comfortable, and do it with dignity. And I think that's really cool because I had never really done that before. Not that I hadn't treated patients with dignity, but I mean, I'd come from a like a bigger inner city type system where you know, I mean, dude, you're just like turning calls. You're just and you're new, so all you want to do is do gunshot wound after gunshot wound after gunshot wound, whatever, right? And I had never really taken care of people, and so my growth and development kind of seemed to coincide with when I went to work for this program this uh, ambulance service, and I learned a ton. It really grew me up a lot. <coughs> so, anyway. So there's all kinds of stuff. So recognizing it. Okay, this is kind of back to what we were talking about, right? And if you've ever worked in Reno, this is like, you know, a 10 times a day event. Okay, so, so you first must recognize them. And to recognize them, you have to look for them. So that means you have to assess everybody. You can't just blow them off and say, this is BS, I don't want to be here, this person doesn't need me, I'm above this. Because you will eventually miss something. And who are you doing a disservice to? Well, obviously yourself if you get busted, but you're really doing a disservice to that patient. And really what we do is we take care of patients, we take care of people. It's not always grand and glorious. It took me to be a lot of years before I finally accepted that fact that if it wasn't going to be pieces and parts everywhere, I really wasn't going to have a lot of fun to where I finally grew up and went, we take care of people. That's what we do. And a lot of it is really mundane, really behind the scenes, but it's really the most important part of my job. One of my mentors from back there kind of dates it, huh, when you look at the ambulance service name. How generic is that? A1. That's the like first one in the phone book. Whoever started that company is like, they're going to see us first. <laughs> So language and cognition. I'd say learn simple phrases. Like, my wife is bilingual. 45% of her patients that she sees are Spanish-speaking only. And she can sit down and have a conversation about 
Guatemala or whatever, and then turn around and talk to them medically. I can't even say like, hi, how's it going? Right? So some of you guys are really good. So you just learn enough to get by so that you can at least do an assessment and figure out what's going on. Or use a family member. That's usually my go-to punt. Usually it's going to be the kid under the age of 14 because they're the ones that are bringing the whole family around because mom and dad may be older and they don't speak English or whatever. Um, the kids have to go to school. So they're usually the best people to give you all kinds of medical information even if it's not technical medical. They can tell you history, patterns of behavior, all this valuable stuff that you can figure out if you can read between the lines. And then, you know, reference materials um, obviously speak to your patient's level. So what's the classic thing you do there? You go on a, like a transient guy and you say, what day is it? And he goes, oh, I don't know, it's like, you know, March 19th, 1975. And you're like, oh shit, he's altered, he's got to go to the hospital. It's like, tomorrow he may say it's March 20th, 1979. He may not be altered at all. That's just the world the guy lives in, right? So we have to just be aware of that stuff. And then just whatever education you can kind of get on autism and all the other cognitive disorders that are specialties in and of themselves, which is easy for me to say because I don't know a lot about that stuff. But you'd be amazed at the high-functioning autistics in this country that we look at every day on the TV screen and you would never know. <laughs> Or you would know. <laughs> I was trying to be nice. What about emotional states? I think that affects pe people's pain perception or how they may describe their pain. We talked about it a little bit, right? Okay, so fear, panic, anger, distress, or the stoic person that doesn't want to admit that they're hurting at all. I mean, my experience has always been you go to a ranch, somebody gets bucked off a horse or whatever, everybody's running around like chickens with their heads cut off, and the patient, who's a 70-year-old woman who's lived there her whole life, is the one that's keeping it all together, and she's the one with the bone in sticking out of her leg. You know what I mean? I mean, so that kind of stuff all factors in. Um, psychological distress, the other part of that could be um, drug-induced states. Okay, right? People on, on meth or... I don't know, what else? Salt. Angel dust, I don't know if they even have angel dust anymore. Salts. Bath salts, yeah, excited delirium kind of stuff, right, okay. So, that's not really a pain thing, although they may be experiencing pain. Um, we're just trying to put them down to keep us from getting our ass kicked, right? And to keep them from hurting themselves, okay? So, in, in the aircraft, uh, especially, because, you know, it's small, there's not a lot of isolation between the patient and the pilot, and, um, yeah, we'll do whatever we have to do. So, that all factors in. Alright, so this is kind of a busy slide, but I think it's because it's, um, I think it's really important, is how bias affects our ability to perceive a patient's pain and deliver care to people that are in pain. Um, so, when you look at this stuff, and this is, you know, I'm not going to read all this, it's uh, big studies from the National Institute of Health, okay? And when they did these studies, they found obviously that people with lower economic status tended to receive a lot less pain meds than people like, say, you and I, even though we may consider ourselves lower economic status, I don't know, you know, based on the, how much we make. But I'm talking, you pick up a person that lives on the street, they're complaining of a lot of pain, they've got a cellulitis or an infected foot and they may even be septic and they're having a ton of pain. Do we look at them the same as we look if we picked up the mayor's wife? I think we don't. And my point is, we need to change that, you know, if we're really going to do our job, okay? So we talked about assumed drug-seeking behavior, um, chronic pain people with no insurance. Um, I would like to think that we take care of people regardless of their socioeconomic status once they're laying in front of us. I know that's not entirely true, but the one thing that um, just drives me up a freaking wall is when somebody does that. Well, they don't have any insurance. We're not going to get paid for this anyway. Like it's an excuse. That's crap. You know? I mean, it doesn't matter. That's not what we're there for. We're there to take care of people. And really, pain complaints are probably in the top three of reasons why EMS gets called. 
doesn't matter what it's for. It could be something totally vague, nonspecific, or it could be an acute injury. But pain is like something we deal with every single day, multiple times a day. So we need to look at that. So um, racial and ethnic and gender stuff, obviously um, women tend to get less pain meds, especially when they have atypical pain. And women, 90% of the time, have atypical pain because they're women, they're not men. And they manifest pain differently. Okay, that's just a physiological fact. And so, because people don't want to look at it that way, or they're not educated to the differences, they tend to not get the same amount of analgesia that men get. And that's garbage, Jeez. right? I mean, what are some? What could you think of where uh, potentially a woman may not may present with a case? and not get as much analgesia as a guy. Because ten, technically, or not technically, but women tend to be more stoic. They tend to not complain as much about things like guys. I mean, you know, we get into all that wives and wherefore stuff, right? Throw it out. You could throw it out there. I bet you could. Plain old pointers. <laughs> exactly, okay? So how about, um, remember when ACLS used to talk about uh, doing all the uh, Mona and all that kind of jazz, right? <clears throat> but it was always like it's a guy. It was always a guy. And then they started entering women into it with, and they started using that term atypical pain because they don't manifest pain like guys do for a lot of different reasons. But women were not getting the care they needed, even ACLS type drugs, because they were women. And that's only been 10 years. It's not anything like, uh, you know, we're not talking like the 1800s. So, um, just a big deal there. Um, people with different ethnic backgrounds, racial backgrounds, and even gender may have problems navigating the healthcare system. So they just don't get how they access things or the right way to do it. And sometimes that aggravates us, especially at 3 o'clock in the morning when we're on our 15th call and we haven't slept since 7 o'clock a.m. Okay, but that is kind of our job, you know, to kind of to take care of people. And then my <laughs> wife wanted to make sure that I put in narcotic naivete. Okay, and what we mean by that? Well, does it, do you guys know what I mean by that? Is that you? Let me give you an example. I think that'll make it more simple. So Pat used to do medical missions to Mexico before she became a nurse practitioner, and they go down and they do surgeries and all kinds of stuff. And they'd have, like, they'd be there for maybe a week. <coughs> and you'd get this little old abuela who would come walk 50 miles to get her hip work, work on. Okay, so she's walking to get a hip problem fixed. <laughs> right? And she shows up a day late. They're gone. And everybody's like, sorry, man, you got some dates wrong, whatever, you know. Or something held her up. She turns around and walks back home. Comes back the next day, or the next year and they meet her, and they do, or they do like gallbladder surgery. Now we do scoped surgeries, right? So there's less pain, less scarring, all that jazz. But when they're doing stuff like that, they may not have that equipment, so they may be doing an open cold. You know what they give those people to go home with? A bag of Tylenol. <laughs> now, so then all of a sudden they're in this country, and they have pain, and we're used to using fentanyl, morphine, ketamine, and we give them, we give her two milligrams of morphine. And she is out like a light for like four hours. <laughs> okay? That is narcotic naivete. So people just aren't used to it. They don't understand how it works because they've never had access. Um, and we all have people like, you know, you've got the five foot two person who is 100 pounds and you give them 400 mics of fentanyl and they're still like blah, 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 all the way to the hospital, you know? And then you've got the 300 pound guy who's like this big lumberjack dude, you can barely get him on your bed, you give him five of MS and he's snoring. Right, we've all seen that. <clears throat> okay, so you have to take that into account when you're, um, when you're giving pain meds. And then language stuff, okay. So an interesting fact from the National Institute of Health is less than 20% of health professionals <laughs> treating Hispanic pain patients report Spanish proficiency at the needed level to deliver care. Okay, so you go on a scene, you've got a whole entire family of Spanish-speaking only people, tons of hurt, people, broken limbs and all that, and like I can barely say Dolor. 
You know what I mean? It's like, so can we really take care of them? Well, I mean, we're going to do the best we can do, so I'm not, like, giving you a hard time or anything. But it's just stuff that factors in. How about misunderstanding? So maybe we don't understand what their pain threshold is. Maybe they don't know what you mean when you ask them what their pain threshold is. You know? Is it chronic or acute? We talk about all the different types of expression. And here's one that I think we probably see more often than we realize. People don't want to discuss their pain level because if they accept it and they verbalize it, that means they're getting worse. Right? I mean, how many times have you seen people you're taking into the ER and, and uh, they don't really want to talk about it because if they start talking to you about it, that means, like, it's real, man. Like, they're really having the big one, or they're really having something critical go on, and they don't want that to happen, so they're kind of reluctant. I mean, does it happen to you? Because it happens to me in the aircraft. And so you have to kind of talk them through that kind of stuff. And then education level. So this is from the Brookings Institute, 2009. And there is the line for emergency medical technicians and paramedics. So we're looking at about, uh, I don't know, 15% have high, our high school grads. Then we can bump all the way up to like, yeah, I don't know, 65, 68% have some college. And then even less have a bachelor's degree or above a bachelor's degree. And the only reason I put this in isn't because it makes you a bad care provider, but I think we lack over the years, in this country anyway, we've really lacked the formal education in emergency care that other countries necessarily make it a prerequisite to even practice. In Canada, if you're going to work for one of the big services, you have to have a four-year degree. So it doesn't mean that they're better than us, but that does mean they're more educated than us. And that can play a part in delivery of care or pain management stuff because, you know, we just... Get a little more educated. This is speaking from a guy that doesn't have a ton of education. Okay, so I can totally value it and try and do whatever I can. And it's tough because I think that's the hardest part of our job. Maintaining our certs, continuing education. Our job is the easy part. Showing up to work and doing what we do, that's like a, it's not a no-brainer, but I mean it's the easy part, right? Maintaining all that stuff and trying to progress through the ranks while you have a life and a family and kids and that whole nine yards, that's the hard part. Right, so anyway. So here we are back to pain, the fifth vital sign. So that's really what I want you to take away from that. So somatic pain, okay? Both somatic and visceral are classified under the nociceptive, and that's just that you have pain receptors in your gut, in your organs, and in your skin, bones, connective tissue, and that's what picks up your pain, okay? so. When you're thinking somatic, you're thinking skin, muscles, bones, joints, can be superficial or deep. Usually it's like dull or aching, okay, unless it's skin stuff. And that's just some types of descriptive terms that people use. So you're, you guys are all familiar with this. What about visceral pain? When you have somebody that's got... Uh, an ischemic bowel. Can you really pinpoint where that pain is in their belly? I mean, yeah, you can go between like their rib cage and their umbilicus, and that's about as close as you can usually get because it's kind of vague, right? I mean, they have it, but they can't really, it's not pinpoint. You can't really narrow it down, okay? So the visceral organs are really sensitive to like distension, ischemia, and inflammation, all the things that we transport patients to the hospital for all the damn time, okay? Getting too like um, mundane for you guys? No, no. Okay. You guys need a break? <clears throat> yeah, we can take a break. We need a break. No. Totally up to you guys. So we talked about visceral somatic pain, right? 
And then neuropathic pain. This is probably, I think this is probably more common for us to see pre-hospitally than the other two. Really, I mean, how many chronic pain patients do you see that are always hurting here? They call you and they're out of their Norco, or they're on MS Cotton, or they take Dilaudid, or whatever, and they have breakthrough pain, which people can have. Now, I'm not telling you that there aren't drug-seeking folks out there, because that's why the hospitals keep all kinds of lists. Because <laughs> there are. Okay, so that's not what I'm trying to say. But there is, there is a subset of these patients that have chronic pain that still require us to help them out, you know. And we may not be able to help them long term, but we can help them in the time that we're with them. So we can't cover everything. So um, neuropathic pain is generally caused by injuries to the central nervous system, right? So people have strokes, they can end up with chronic pain after that, okay? Um, brain tumors, obviously, spinal cord injuries. Um, people get uh, phantom pain. Have you, you guys said you've mm -hmm. seen a lot of people with that. It's real to them. So diabetic neuropathy is probably one of the biggies, right? You get somebody that's got neuropathies and they, you ask them, you know, how you doing, where you hurt, whatever, and they tell you that their feet feel like they're on fire all the time, right? I mean, that's not something that you can necessarily change, but you may be able to help moderate that on the way to the hospital. If your protocols allow you to make those kinds of choices, you know? I mean, and then infection and obviously compressed nerve stuff can cause issues. <clears throat> So, scoring tools, what do you guys use? Like one to ten. Okay. And that, you know what? You know the beauty of the one to ten scale? Is everybody knows, I mean, you, we all know what we need. Patients may not, so it's kind of subjective, but it's easy to use, it's easy to score, and you can prove what you did had a negligible or good effect. And that's really, I mean, charting is legal stuff, right? So. We don't just go out there. I mean, this job would be awesome if we went out and just took care of patients all day long and didn't have to write charts. <laughs> what was hell, man? You know, go out and do all kinds of fun things and come back and go, okay, time for a cup of coffee. Oh, got another one. Didn't have to worry about four hours of charting afterwards. Um, nonetheless, we do. So. so there's a ton of scoring tools. I only picked out two or three of them, and I included peds as well as adults <clears throat> because peds do have kind of a different manifestation of pain. Um, to us, and a lot of it is because they're not communicative the way that we look at kids being the way people are communicative, unless you've got children. And I had puppies, so you know, it's not quite the same thing, right? Um, so, <clears throat> you want to be able to score your patient whether they're conscious or unconscious, keep your scoring simple and easy to interpret every 10 minutes or when your mandated vital signs checks are if they're every 15 or if it's situational like critical or given certain types of meds they may say every five whatever okay but it's a vital sign so when you do a blood pressure you should be doing a pain assessment okay and then make it real easy to add to your charting system now one that we use so i just brought a copy so you guys can just look at it we've got i've got a picture of it up here but it's the critical care pain observation tool so it's for people that are unconscious and innovative Okay, so you can't go, hey, how much you hurt? Okay, I mean, you can. You can bring them up from their sedation and then ask them and then put them back down, but that really kind of defeats the purpose in our realm. So you look at things like facial expression. That's probably the most tried and true method of being able to determine somebody's pain response or their threshold is their facial expression. Because even when they're unconscious, if they're having chronic pain, they furrow their brow or they grimace or whatever. Right? So you just kind of learn to look at that stuff. And it's still subjective because you have to give a number of stuff that doesn't necessarily fit a tried and true presentation. But it just gives you something to, have to work with. So there you go. 1 to 10 pain scoring. It is pretty easy. 1 to 10. Most people can understand that. You can get creative. I mean, you can do like a Zero was no pain, and ten was like we slap your whatever in the door, you know? Most people know what that means. Or you can kind of adapt it for women, okay? Like, it's a really common for people to say, uh, you know, ten was childbirth or whatever. I don't know. I don't know. You, got, you just have to kind of adapt it to your patient. But So you look at this guy. He doesn't look like he's really having a good time with it. So how would you rate it? 
You know? So he gives you a 35. How many times does that happen? 1 to 10 scale. 0 being no pain. 10 being the worst. It's a 20! It's like, okay, so you're a math genius. <laughs> so, but, really, does that go back to our perception and their perception of the pain? And that kind of gives you the limited efficacy of pain scoring. You know, because what we're trying to do is pigeonhole their experience into our understanding. And that's really the kind of the thrust of this whole pain management thing. Okay, so that's really what we're trying to do. So we have to really believe people. Like you said, when you bring patients in and you give them a bunch of meds and they're still sitting up complaining of pain, I mean, we're fortunate enough that for the most part, we can give them everything in the box. And we may get a little hard time, but our physician advisor will back us. Um, and we don't, but we do deliver to docs that I've been chewed out in the trauma room tons of times for bringing a patient in that's, you know, multi-trauma, they got fractures everywhere and they're ahead. And now they're not snoring, but they're, you know, they're not dancing all over the bed and crying and screaming and reaching out and the doc's like, now how am I supposed to assess their mentation? I mean, you really don't want to say what you think. So you say, well, they're going to the scanner. You know what I mean? I mean, they're sat to 99%. They got a good, good uh, swallow reflex. They're managing their airway just fine. Their blood pressure's dropped 20 points on each side, and their heart rate was 150, and now it's 96. Okay. Did we help them? I think we did. Now, there's always a bigger picture than what we see. In my world, there's always a bigger picture than what I see, as my wife tells me. But um, um, it just—it's relative, right? So one to ten. That seems to work pretty good. Or the bong waker scale. <laughs> okay? So this is actually used in a lot of charting systems. They have one for kids and they have one for adults. Here I've been nice enough to give you the English, Spanish, Vietnamese, Hmong, and Russian version. You know, because that's just the kind of guy I am. Okay? Um, but it kind of... It's meant to be an observational tool, and it's also something that you can use when a person doesn't have, when you have a language barrier. So if you have these cards, which a lot of places carry them, you can show them the card and just kind of tell them to point to where they feel like they are, and so you're at least getting a little bit of their personal assessment of what's going on with them. Maybe it's a little too simplistic. You guys all know um, Steve Barry, right? You've all seen Steve Barry cartoons and all that. <laughs> I didn't put it up here, but he's got a great one. He has a little editorial in one of the AMS magazines about the Long Baker Scale and how pain scoring systems are really don't do the job they're supposed to do. When somebody looks like this, or they look like, okay, this we get, no hurt. But you start getting down to this end. He's like, how many times have you seen people with just some crocodile tears in there? When in fact, what he thinks the number 10 should be is a guy that's like completely freaked out holding a gun to his head. Like, I just want to shoot myself. You know, I mean, it's just not that realistic, but it does help. So, and that's what we have to do. Okay. Thing is, it only really helps you with conscious people. So if they're unconscious, can't really... So what, what do we do? We, we do like the ABPU scale. Um, what else do you guys use to determine unconscious if you're going to be given pain meds? Because I'm assuming that you want to justify why you did it, you know? Mm -hmm. So what, what else do you guys use if they're unconscious? If they're unconscious, they're unconscious. They're unconscious. They're unconscious. They're unconscious. they're unconscious. Okay. So, you know, you can do pain stuff like, you know, do they withdraw? Do they do cerebral posturing to pain, do they do cortica posturing to pain, that kind of stuff. And that's all not your, it's your assessment and it's objective, not like subjective, like, hey, I'm pretty sure this guy's hurting because he's got a huge stake running through the back of his head. But nobody's really going to accept that. You know what I mean? It's, and we have, to, we have to look at it that way. So um, this CPOT score that I passed around to you guys um, kind of gives you some illustrations of ways to assess giving pain meds to people that are unconscious and can't quantify it for you. Um, because we run into it every day. I mean, really, you know, it's a tough thing. So if we have a person that's, you know, we pick up wherever, and they're intubated and sedated and they're unconscious and 
um, may or may not be on propofol. I mean, propofol is an analge has analgesic properties as well as sedative properties. Okay, but you go to move them or you go to do something and they grimace. Are they still having pain? Mm -hmm. Hell yeah, they're still having pain. And I mean, the docs will tell us, oh, they're on propofol. They don't need any pain meds. It's all, got all the analgesia they need. Well, that's great. But what we run into is because it has vasodilatory properties, they will bump them up to such a high dose to try and take care of their pain <coughs> that they drop their pressure into the 60s, and now we have vital organ perfusion problems, right? So we give them fentanyl. We give them all kinds of stuff. Um, because people can still have pain and be unconscious. I mean, they just can't express it. <coughs> Here's one for kids. The cries pain scale. Seems pretty appropriate, right? So we're looking at their crying, um, the characteristic of the cry, right? Um, it's usually used for um, neonates, so some of the terms in here will be uh, more appropriate for neonatal stuff. <clears throat> Do they require, <coughs> oh, you know, more O2, less O2? Is that because of sedation, or is it because of their work of breathing, or is it because their metabolic demand is higher because they're having pain, and they require more oxygen to keep their threshold of oxygenation appropriate? Uh, vital signs, uh, heart rate, and blood pressure. We use that too for unconscious people, but it's been proven to not be as effective as we once thought it was. So when you have an unconscious person that you are, um, you look at them and you go, I mean, we, we still do it every day. You got an unconscious person, they're stated, they're ventilated, and you know, all of a sudden you're looking at the end title and you start to see like the little little bump in their, in their uh, waveform that says they're starting to come up from their paralytic, right? And then their heart rate goes up to 110 from 90. They're probably waking up, okay? It's not totally effective to determine because some people may be on meds where their heart rate's 110 normally, right? They may be on tricyclic antidepressants as a standard thing. Now they're unconscious because they're a trauma. <coughs> you can't use it, but uh, if their normal baseline vital signs are kind of within normal limits or whatever and you start to see big changes like 20%, then that's something to consider. Um, okay, so kids, look at their expression. Remember I said, um, facial expression is valuable. So it says, the facial expression most often associated with pain is a grimace. A grimace may be characterized by brow lowering, eyes squeeze shut, deepening of the nasal labial furrow, or opening lips and mouth. And that's pretty much holds true for adults as well as neonates, for sure. And then sleeplessness. So we're looking at, um, this is a, a good thing. I don't really know what they use it even now at the, in the NICU, but it's a, a kid thing. Or the flax scale. This is the one you'll probably see more commonly with peds. Okay, if you're looking at a specific pediatric pain scoring system. Evaluates their facial expression, their extremity movement, their activity, their cry, and probably the most important thing as parents know is their consolability. Right? So if you have kids that you can like calm down and console by doing whatever you do, that gives you some valuable information as to whether or not the level of pain they may be experiencing or what's going on. If you can't console them no matter what you do, it's a big deal. You go to the pediatrician, right? Or you go to the ER or whatever because that's not normal. So it's used for both awake and asleep kids and then you give them a score. So you go down the list with all this stuff and you give them a 0, 1 to 3, 4 to 6, or 7 to 10 score and kind of determine. And then every time you do a set of vital signs, you do this assessment so you can determine whether your pain management strategy is working or needs to be altered. And 1 to 10 works good on kids if they can tell, you know, I mean, a lot of times the Long Baker thing works really good on kids because they can look at the picture and just kind of point to you. But sometimes they're just not able to really <coughs> articulate. They just tell you it hurts. You got to go with that, right? And then the CPOT pain scale. This is what we're using for our critical care um, observation tool and for intubated patients. So, <laughs> and we use facial expression as a huge thing. So, up here, your descriptions, it's kind of small, sorry, but uh, no muscular tension observed, 
presence of frowning, brow lowering, orbit tightening, and levator contraction, or all of the above facial movements plus eyelid tightly closed, like they're grimacing, like they really are. And you'll see people that are unconscious and sedated and innovated doing this stuff. And you're like, hey, they're hurt. So we give them more pain meds and you'll see their face relax. Okay? So, and then we check their body movement. We check their muscle tension to see if they're relaxed or if they have muscular tension or resistance. They're pulling against their restraints because they're hurting. Okay? And big, the big, one of the biggies for us is compliance with the vent. So if you have an unconscious person and they start waking up, you guys, compliance to the bag, you're going to tell, you're going to be able to feel that right away. For us, if they're on a ventilator, we have to look at numbers and we have to look at them because we don't have a bag to feel if they're on a vent. So we have to look at their pips, we have to look at their plateau pressures, we have to make sure we don't have um, kinks in the tubing like a mechanical type of resistance. Um, and it could just be that they're starting to come up from their paralytics or are starting to hurt. So they're kind of breathing, and they're out of sync with the vent. And you notice that right away because we set those limits and then it alerts. And even in the aircraft, you can hear it. But generally, you have to feel patients and look at them in the aircraft because you can't hear things as well. You can't hear your shit now, but you know. So um, yeah, it's you know, there's there's different ways of, of doing that. And then vocalization stuff. So are they talking in a normal tone? Are they sighing and moaning? Are they crying out and sobbing? And then we give them a score, and from that. We have, we're expected to do that every 10 minutes. When we do a set of vital signs, that's one of our vital signs that we have to do. And if they're good, you know, they get a zero. If they're bad, they get an eight. But then we have to prove that we did something about that pain score and what kind of reaction they had to what we did. Okay? And if we don't, that's one of the, the guaranteed things that will get you a phone call and a comment on your chart. Like, I think you need to do an addendum or we need to talk about it or what the heck was your major malfunction? <laughs> right? So there's different types of scoring systems. It's more a matter of finding what works for you in your situation. All right. So we're almost done. Common analgesics and pain management strategies. Okay? So we can get really detailed for sure. But I just picked, actually, I didn't put um, ketamine on there. I put the slides and forgot to add it to the list because it's not. It's not really an analgesic, it's a sedative hypnotic type medicine that has analgesic properties. Um, it's like a general anesthetic kind of thing. But anyway, that was more of a screw up on my part. So we are going to talk about that. So, nitrous. You guys carry nitrous? Mm -hmm. You know, I never used it much, except for when I worked in the ER back in Colorado. And we used it all the time when we would have like um, bike races that would crash and we had to scrub the road rash, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, when you're scrubbing somebody from, like, here to here with a bristle brush to get all the gravel out of stuff, I mean, yeah, you use, like, topical hurricane spray and lidocaine gel and that kind of jazz, but it doesn't really cut it, man. Um, now they can use things like ketamine. We used nitrous. We used it then. And it was awesome. I mean, people still had pain, but their perception of the pain was a little altered, right? So I think it's a good drug. It's like, I... Over the years, I've come to believe that less invasive is better. When I first started, I was like, hell no, everybody's getting everything. Because it's kind of how I was, I guess. So nitrous works good. Morphine, you guys are familiar with. Fentanyl, you're familiar with. Dilaudid, I don't, some people carry it, some people don't. You'll see it a lot in your transfers or in the hospital because it tends to last a little bit longer, and it's a, it's a pretty effective pain med. Um, but we don't carry it, and you guys probably don't carry it. Okay, so strategies, okay? We can get into all kinds of pharmacological strategies, but I think in the pre-hospital setting, what works the best <coughs> is the simplest and the least invasive. And it, it's amazing what you can do with stuff like this. The first one is weight-based dosing. So remember when we used to write protocols and we'd be like, give two milligrams every three minutes, you know, blah, 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 there was, right? Instead of figure out what their total dose should be based on the amount of milligrams or mics or whatever per kilo and dose to that. When they started doing that about 15 years ago in research, they found, lo and behold, amazing. People had better pain management, right? We weren't just like throwing things at them to throw things at them because I think what we were doing was trying to make us feel better, okay? Here we're actually, we have a plan, okay? And we're using a proven uh, strategy that works. 
Now these other three, I don't know if you guys are thinking this is, we're going back to the philosophy discussion that we had earlier, so I apologize. That's what you think. But I can tell you that simple eye contact and reassurance does a huge amount for people's pain management. It can manage their perception of their pain and you can actually cause people's pain to decrease because they're not so hypersensitive and amped up that they're able to get a grip on it. Now that doesn't mean you're not going to do <coughs> IV stuff or intranasal or whatever, but the simple stuff makes a huge difference, man. I mean, you get somebody in the aircraft and if you just talk to them and tell them what you're going to do and just kind of be <coughs> personable. So I talk and I let them see like, you know, my partner because if they see me, they're going to like freak out, right? So I sit in the right seat and talk to them my partner actually looks at them. But you can drop people's blood pressure 10 points. You can drop their heart rate 20 points just by talking to them. Okay, it's a big deal, even if they're unconscious. Okay, so and then the old elevation splinting and icing stuff. From personal experience, I can tell you that when I had my injuries, what helped me more than it, well, what helped me more than anything was two perks said every four hours, but what really helped before that was elevation. Because you decrease the blood flow and kind of the engorgement, which creates tissue compression, and there's nerves in there, right? And that's what causes pain. Okay? So you're actually backing that stuff off a little bit. It makes a huge difference. And then explain stuff. Does that make sense? Is there anything else you guys would rather would like to add to that? Teddy bears. I'm sorry? I said teddy bears. Teddy bears, yeah, there you go. I was going to say a pillow over their face, but, you know, it's me. <laughs> but, yeah, stuff like that helps with kids. It helps a lot. I mean, you guys carry stuff, I think. We carry them, and um, people like that. I give them to old people all the time. I mean, whatever, but just some simple kindness. So nitrous oxide, right? Colorless, odorless, pretty safe and effective, I think. It's pretty short onset, quick, rapid onset, and really short acting. It's kind of a combined analgesic and anxiolytic. And it has kind of similar properties to both morphine and benzodiazepine. So that's why I think it's a really good drug for you guys to use. Um, in fact, you can use it, in, to use it in combination with IV meds as well. Or can you if you want to? You tend to use it more for the people that you would consider to be like less critical, like ankles and stuff like that. Yes. Because it's a great drug for that. More somatic. What's that? More somatic type. Thing. Okay. All right. So and it, it but it does kind of act on the opioid and the GABA three receptors. So and it's kind of a cool app. I don't know uh, what you got in that bag. Huh. Morphine. Probably the most common analgesic used in pre-hospital care, right? Schedule two opi opioid agonist, highly regulated, big CNS depression, and great synergistic effects when you give it with other CNS depressant meds. Now that could be a good thing, or it could be a really bad thing. And probably there isn't a person in this room that's been practicing for more than a couple of years that hasn't overdosed somebody and had to bag them up, or put them on some oxygen, or stimulate them a little bit, happens. But it goes away. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, like, to, to chase them and give them Narcan and that kind of stuff, which occasionally we'll find in some of the outlying areas, the providers out there, they'll, like, give somebody, you know, 10 of morphine, 100 of fentanyl, and 5 of Versed, like, all at once. Whammo! And this person that's talking to me has now got a blood pressure of 60, and they got, like, one breath in it. You know? <laughs> so are they hurting anymore? Hell no. And they won't remember a damn thing. Hopefully they won't remember who did that to them. Okay? But, um, you know, then they'll give them Narcan. Then they'll bring them up. And then they're chasing. Oh my God, we need to give them some more percent because now they're combative. And they get into this vicious cycle. I would say, unless it's really, really detrimental, kind of ride it out, bag them up if you need to. And if you're going to give Narcan, titrate it. You know? For sure. So morphine can be given PO, sub-Q, IV, IM. Good drug, works well, not expensive. Dosing is dependent on whatever your protocols are. Um, it has a little longer onset of action, so it has a little longer duration of action, half-life. Um, I think it works kind of good when you have, it works great on burn pain, okay? Okay, so it works really good with burn pain. 
I don't think fentanyl works as well. But um, what I like to do anyway is give fentanyl and then coast them on morphine and then bolus them on fentanyl. Now, now that we have ketamine, we don't even do that. We just give them ketamine and give them both doses of, of uh, fentanyl. But morphine lasts a little longer, so you're not chasing your tail and doing that whole peak and trough thing with drug distribution. Fentanyl. I love this drug, man. I remember when it was, I mean, you still like, we're up in, um, we're going to be in Beckworth and we're in NorCal, and they are allowing, they're, I think they're going, they're had doing a study about whether fentanyl is efficacious. It's just the way different states are differently. California has always been California. Okay, so, but it is a really potent drug that you need to be aware of, right? So, like I said, it's 80 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Um, it's about 50 times more potent than pure heroin. So, if you have someone that doesn't have any tolerance to narcotics, you got to be careful because you can totally knock out the respiratory drive. It doesn't do it as significantly, I think, as morphine, but it still has the potential, okay? So when you have little kids or you have old people and you're given fentanyl to, I always kind of subscribe to uh, less, maybe more, and you can't take it back once you give it. So, you know, you may have somebody from the assisted living place over by us, and you may just give them 25 mic increments at a time or less. That's totally fine. The idea is to get where you want to get them, but they're pain. It doesn't matter how you get there, you know? So, um, just things to think about. In the ER, um, I don't even know if they have them anymore. They used to have fentanyl lollipops for kids that were getting sutures, and they'd give them a fentanyl lollipop. And after a couple minutes of sucking on it, they'd be like, hey, cool, I come to the ER, I get a sucker, you know? And then a few minutes later, they were totally calm, cool, and collected, and they could suture up their face or do whatever they needed to do. And then we see it a lot as dirt chasing patches. It's <coughs> chronic pain people. And that can be in different dosage amounts. Okay, so when you have somebody that's really hypotensive or they're super altered, you know, I think it's like a totally standard thing. We check people's blood sugar. Well, the other thing to look at is do they have any patches on? And then you are faced with the quandary of do you take it off? <coughs> chronic pain patient? Or do you leave it on and fix that some other way. And then there is, um, for cancer patients, they have a really nice fentanyl sublingual spray. So, rapid acting, short duration, 0.1 to 0.3 mics per kilo is a really low dose. That's like a standard thing in like Hippocrates, right? If we are given our fentanyl, it's one to two mics per kilo, or up to 100 at a time, and we can give it as often as we think we need to. We only carry 400 mics, um, yeah, you but it's not uncommon to get the whole in 20 minutes. Give 400 mics but and morphine and other stuff. In all fairness, that that 400 mics on the average—I don't know how it's the average. Let's just say most most of the time, that's not enough to cause respiratory infection. Is it? Generally, not. It I depends so. how you give it. Yeah. And remember, like I subscribe to the pain is a great antidote for narcotics. <laughs> okay. Um, I think if you were to give somebody 400 mics whammo, oh, yes. it's a big time. But you know, if you titrate 50 or 100 at a time, Q5. Yeah, that's what I thought. But the other thing, too, is to you have to learn to read your patients and see what other comorbidities they have and what other kind of stuff's going on. Mm -hmm. Because they may have be on other meds, um, they may be not have a, a threshold or a tolerance. So you have to, you don't want to get yourself in over your head, but the other nice thing about this is that it's got like a 25 minute half-life. So if you depress them, yeah, you can, you can really write it out, right, you know? But we can't reverse it. We can. Well, I mean, we used to carry um, a <coughs> for benzos, for example, you know? Mm -hmm. And we don't anymore. Um, we are revisiting that, but generally, if people are on chronic benzos, you don't want to reverse them. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like we have other things we can go down the pathway to take care of them mm -hmm. instead of reversing it. And they just had issues, so it's one of those things that it's probably the better part of Valor. We don't have to have an antidote for everything. Dilaudid. 
Okay, this is prepotent, potent CNS depressant. Um, it's a derivative of morphine. Um, obviously, all narcotics have de decreased gastric motility as a side effect. Um, but, you know, you get somebody that has a paralytic il ileus because they're a big trauma patient, they've been in the ICU, um, they just come home, they got a lot of pain. Well, we don't carry it, so we don't have to worry about it, but you're not going to see them getting probably a lot because of that kind of stuff. And it can cause hypotension, but most of the narcotics can. This is, has a, a good side effect profile of hypotension because of the history. And that's the other thing you see when you get fentanyl, right? People start doing this. Have you, you ever see that with your patients? Mm -hmm. That's one of the ways, that anecdotally, we determine they're starting to get therapeutic. We give them a ton of fentanyl, and all of a sudden they're like, scratch my nose, will you? Because you get the histamine release, and it makes your nose itch. And so, you know, if they got positive <laughs> nose scratching, we're like, hey, we're getting there. <laughs> of course, if you give them ketamine, they can't do that. So. <laughs> But uh, yeah, just things to look at. <laughs> and then ketamine. Really cool drug. I think pre-hospital care, especially trauma care, has gotten so much of its education from the military. Those guys are on it. You know, they're not going to wait five years to go through a bunch of studies to figure something out. If it works, they're going to do their studies and then they're going to get it out to the guys that need to use it. And this is kind of where, I mean, ketamine's been around forever. When I first started in EMS, I worked in kind of a, after I left the city, I worked in a rural area, and it was really common for the little gangsters to come up from Denver to try and steal ketamine because it's a tranquilizer that's used on ranches all the time in veterinary medicine. They'd come up to steal it because it brought a high price on the street. Well, shit, next thing you know, we're going on a double shooting because the rancher would be like, right, just lead them a little more you know, as they're running away, <laughs> right? And so you'd have two dead kids from downtown Denver or whatever on somebody's property when in fact you went out for an unknown disturbance or whatever, okay? So it's been around for a long time. Um, without all the history of how, they came, how it came about and all that jazz, it's here, okay? So a rapid acting dissociative anesthetic with some analgesic properties, but it's a dissociative drug. So it doesn't necessarily remove someone's pain, what it does is it removes their perception of the pain. So it dissociates their awareness from the pain response. Okay, so you're not really getting rid of the pain, like when you see us given that. They just don't really give a darn, mm -hmm. you know? And, um, and that's good because it works synergistically really nice with like fentanyl. That says you know? 510 ml? Yes. What's the standard? dose. That's our, our standard dose for us is one to two milligrams per kilo for um, sedation or induction. Okay, mm -hmm. So when you're looking at that and we've been talking about trying to get something that is not quite as concentrated so that we don't have to like have like these mini syringes you know and all mm -hmm. that because when you're pulling that up <coughs> you're giving one to two mls <laughs> at the mo or not even 0.1 to 0.2 yeah. 0.3 you know so uh, that would make it easier for us but this is how we're getting it right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Yes. The nice thing about ketamine is your pharyngeal neuronal um, reflexes are maintained. So if you give it, it doesn't really cause respiratory depression. And what's more important when you're looking at evaluating somebody's airway isn't necessarily their gag, it's their swallow. Okay. Is it IV only? Uh, you know, I don't know if you can give it IM or not. And I should know that because we give it, because we only just give it IV. Mm -hmm. I think you can give it IM. I'm pretty sure most of these most of these drugs you can give IM. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's a recent treatment. Yeah, I feel like that's a recent uh, place we can. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. See you later. So. Um, so it, you can maintain airway reflexes with it, which is cool. So if we give somebody ketamine and some fentanyl, we don't necessarily need to innovate. Okay, and that's a good thing because innovation isn't really the least um, side effect ridden procedure that we do, right? It has a lot of bad side effects, potentially. Um, it does well with MAP, so that's the mean arterial pressure, okay? Um, and we were trying to keep that generally between 60 at the bottom between 60 and 80 for a MAP. And we determine most of our blood pressure is not systolically, but we calculate MAPs on all of them because that's really your vital organ perfusion, your mean arterial pressure. Okay. 
So it does well with that. So if you've got somebody that's hypotensive, it, don't, it does not work as a presser, but it should not decrease the blood pressure more. Okay? And a half-life of about 10 to 15 minutes. And when you're jumping through your ass in the aircraft or the back of an ambulance, that can go by really quick. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that's really important is to record or some way keep track of when you gave it so that if you need to redose it, you're not waiting for them to come up. Okay? So that you can keep them under. Okay? For us, it can be kind of a big deal. So, like I said, it's a dissociative drug, so it seems to selectively interrupt the pathways of the brain. So, through the thalamus and the reticular activating system and the limbic system. And you know your RAS, reticular activating system, is what gets sideways when somebody takes a, a hit on the chin and cocks their head back all of a sudden. That's your reticular activating system getting short circuit. Okay? And then it takes a few minutes to reboot. You're good. Well, people. Um, pretty well studied in the hospital, but it's now, just in the last couple of years, become more widely studied and accepted for us in the pre-hospital arena. So big hospitals with lots of patients. General weakness and abdominal pain. <laughs> um, uh, the military and, and uh, bigger hospitals around the country, big teaching hospitals, are starting to do a lot more studies because they're using it so they get the numbers to use it pre-hospitally. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the military's got a lot of really good stuff with ketamine. They've debunked a lot of the old myths about ketamine, which is why we weren't getting to use it because physicians who may not have any experience or had one bad anecdotal experience, I mean, we're all like that, right? Um, would have something go wrong and they'd be like, we are never using this drug ever again. And maybe it was operator error, maybe it was a one in a million, but um, now these studies are starting to debunk a lot of that. Like, used to be, they would say, you absolutely can't give ketamine to somebody with a head injury because you'll increase their intracranial pressure, you'll worsen their bleed, blah, 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 you'll increase the penumbra, do all that. And now they're seeing that that's not necessarily true. Okay? So it's kind of dose dependent and you can mitigate that effect with other meds. So there's just, you know, it's just, it's like anything new, man. It's going to take a while. There is some emergence phenomena that you see. Um, generally tends to happen more with kids. Um, and the emergence, because it's a dissociative anesthetic, anesthetic med, um, people are, you know, lights on, nobody home kind of thing, if you give them a big dose. And they're dissociated, so they really don't have any kind of um, perceptual awareness of their surroundings. So, of course, you give it to them and they're laying on the ground, right? We give it to them, and then we don't redose them. And they wake up, and next thing you know, the world's flying by at like 110 knots. Of course I would freak out. It's like you have no ability to figure out where you are and what's going on. So one of the biggest things you can do to help with that potential emergence phenomena, if you're giving them bigger doses, is benzos and talking to them, even when they're unconscious. Like bringing them up slowly by communicating with them and telling them what's going on and helping them until they kind of get their awareness faculties back. Um, so we generally don't give Versed with ketamine, like in the lower doses that we're given, uh, it, it's usually not a problem. And we do infusions as well. So we'll put ketamine in a bag, we'll run it at 20 to 30 milligrams a minute, which you know, really isn't that much um, for a 200 pound guy, okay? Um, and what you'll find is like people with fractures or abdominal pain or whatever, is they're awake and talking to you like we are right now. And then you're just tweaking them with some fentanyl every once in a while. And they're good. And those aren't the people who have to worry about emergence. It's the people that are completely unconscious. You know, their eyes go like this and they're just like staring off into space, right? Those are the people to think about. Um, but it, it works well uh, as an infusion as well. And that's something that's a little harder to catch on um, for people to do because it just makes them nervous. So we give one to two milligrams per kilo <coughs> for analgesic and induction. So we use it as a pre-induction medicine for people that are being um, RSI. Okay, it works really well. And you can, like I said, don't have to give as much fentanyl or morphine. So, Another example, um, we had a gentleman who fell into a fire and had 25% second and third degree burns to his chest, arms, and face. Okay? 
So didn't need to be innovated because most of the second and third degree was here. His face had first and second degree, um, but he, uh, he did not need to be intubated. And he got 400 mics of fentanyl and 30 milligrams of morphine and was still like, could not lay still. We gave him 75 milligrams of ketamine and he just <laughs> chilled out. And then we just tweaked him with morphine and fentanyl for the rest of the trip over to UC Davis. And he did great. I still, because I've had a couple of emergence, um, people that have emerged um, less than calmly, I guess you could say. And so if somebody's getting ketamine, anything more than just one to two milligram one-time dose, I still put restraints on them. It's just me in the aircraft, you know. So that if something does go south, we at least have that extra few seconds to, to put them down or do whatever we need to do. But it works really well on burns. And it doesn't have a lot of side effects as far as um, liver metabolism and that kind of jazz. So people that are having, that have um, decreased liver function in that, they may retain it a little bit longer, but you're not going to be causing really bad side effects for them to use it. Okay, uh, questions on ketamine? Okay. Yeah, I think, you know, it's just a matter of time, really, you know, I mean, and that's just totally site specific, for sure. Okay. So, um, obviously that doesn't look like the ranchos unless it uh, all of a sudden became tropical, like. <laughs> but anyway, um, so you guys go for a person that's uh, bucked off a horse. Still under the horse and unconscious. Still under the horse. Show up, yeah. Um, you know, I never thought that I would see that until three weeks ago, which is why I used it. I'm like, are you kidding me? The horse like just laid there? What the hell, they're gonna try and get up. Well, the horse broke its leg and couldn't get off this guy. And he was in a depression. He couldn't get off. So he was like, not only that, but he was like doing the wiggle thing trying to get up, so grinding this guy. Oh, you know. So, okay, um, you can hear the person crying out in the backyard, and once you get there, you know, open leg fractures, bleeding, and people in severe pain, somebody in severe pain. So, what do you think? Well, you got an unsecure scene with that horse. I was going to say, I, need to I say we it. shoot it. I'm fine with shooting it. Because yeah. I'm telling you, that is dog food on the hoof, man. My dogs would eat fun. Well, my wife would divorce. They're 1,200 mm -hmm. pounds. They're going to turn around and stick a hoof in your face. No, I can take the horse. Okay, so what we would you guys do? The scene. Yeah, okay, so what would you do? SO. Foam the crap out of it? SO, <laughs> <laughs> they got sidearms. Okay, SO or like. Um, Animal control, animal control or? maybe? Yeah, well, they're going to be so yeah, slow. Yeah, yeah. We're talking a long time. Is this, yeah. is this guy so, totally alert? And is he totally yeah, he's with like, it? Uh, he's, yeah, he's like screaming, yelling. Yeah, we'll say yeah. He's got a Glasgow 14. And the horse is not like totally frantic. It's just wiggling a bit. And yeah, you're, sure. I mean, I don't want to get within the danger zone of his back legs. but Okay, uh -huh. I might. so okay, so we'll say, you know, SO comes, shoots the horse, they pull him off. Okay. Okay. Whatever. Okay, now you got this guy in severe pain. Shit, we could make that last for an hour. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, lower leg fractures, bleeding, a lot of pain. Okay, you can, every time you even look at this guy, like he screams. We I'm all have those kind of patients, yeah. right? Yeah. So the first thing you do is go, up, oh, drug seeker. Mm. You're not getting anything from me. <laughs> yeah. He, is, like, he yeah. is a hardcore seeker. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the things you'll go through. <laughs> Okay, so you're going to have to move him. This is what you see for vitals. What do you think? His heart rate's 38. Okay, so why do you think that could be? Other than the old, you know, he's on beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, he's in complete heart block. Yeah. Is, he, is he vagling himself? Yeah, like pain response, right? People yeah. can vagle themselves and they can drop their heart rates down to nothing mm. just from pain. So my point is, Taking care of his pain actually makes him more hemodynamically stable. Right. Just like you do with rib fractures when they say they can't breathe and you get, you have that nagging little voice by giving <coughs> narcotics, it's going to decrease his respirations, but his SATs are only 88%. What the hell? And you give him 100 mics of fentanyl, and next thing you know, he's taking deep breaths and he's 97%. Mm. It's the same concept. Okay? So just something to be aware of, just things to look at. Yes. I know, I couldn't even keep the pictures consistent. Fantastic. So, um, that looks like a felony stop to me, but you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so, um, so using whatever pain scale you want, what are you going to give this guy for a pain scale? Because you got to chart it. 
Ten. Ten. Okay, yeah, I mean, he's, so you say, t you know, are you going to yeah. go through the whole zero's no pain, no. ten's the worst pain you ever felt in your life, and he, like, if he could get up and smack you, he would do that right now. Yeah. You know? So, yeah, you're going to give it ten, or you're going to describe it in your narrative, right? Okay? And then whatever pain scoring tool you use, how often do you score their pain? How often do you guys like your protocols? Is it like just whenever? Or? Well, that's one of those things that I think is very well defined in our protocols, like it is in other systems. But I, I still try to say, every time before you give meds, and every time after you give them the outcome, you know, and then that way you, you justify. It has uh, was the change was patient improved? Okay. Any change? Okay. I yeah, think and you addressed I mean, it when you said pain's your fifth vital sign, so every time you reassess vitals, you should be able to document that pain. I think so. I mean, and that's going to be what's written for you guys. That's what ri what's <coughs> written for us. And our mm -hmm. policy is an assessment and a set of vitals has to be done at the minimum every 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. If they're on pressors or any type of vasoactive med or they're getting blood, we have to do it every five minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay? So... And then, so you just you have a ton of writing to do, but that's just the charting standard. Mm -hmm. So you go with whatever your charting standard is, you know, right? Or not necessarily right or wrong, yeah. because you're doing subjective and objective assessment of that person. They're laying right in front of you. Mm -hmm. That's how I see it. But if it goes to court, what's on paper is what people make their judgments of your performance by, not what you say you saw. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So just things to think about. So, believe their description, well, for the most part, you know, there's a few exceptions to that rule, right? Use a validated pain scoring system. I think treating pain aggressively is a good thing, for sure. Uh, chart all your assessments, plans, and changes, which you guys do. Uh, the goal is always zero over 10. Are we gonna achieve it? Hell no. If we can get somebody down to a seven sometimes, we feel like we just did our job big time. But that's the goal. So you've got to chart a plan to obtain that goal, right? Um, get educated about pain and its pre-hospital stuff, and then, like I said, pain is the best antidote for narcotics. I can tell you that from personal experience. Cool. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, you guys. Thank you. A little bit on the heavy on the philosophy side at the beginning. Sorry. Oh, that's good. <laughs>